What I'm going to present today is really a condensation of material that we put in our last newsletter. And I think most of the newsletters have been picked up from the back. If you want to read the full article, you can go to uh, our website at utlm.org and then uh, go to our newsletters and you'll be able to find it listed there. Or if you just Google apostasy in Sweden or Swedish apostasy, it'll pull up a link to this article. <clears throat> okay. I got new glasses too, and that's a problem. No, fine. <laughs> I got where this is at, you know. Okay. Since its founding in 1830, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, originally titled the Church of Christ, has struggled with its public image. Charges of fraud related to Joseph Smith's magic practices were a stumbling block to many from the very beginning. In coming years, his visions, new and changing scriptures, secret polygamy, racism, the political kingdom of God, and temple rituals added to the flow of criticism of Joseph Smith and Mormonism. After Smith's death, Brigham Young, the second prophet of the LDS Church, proved to be just as controversial. His sermons on Adam God, racism, blood atonement, government, plural marriage, led to the extensive criticism in the Eastern newspapers and various books. Also, the 1857 Mount Meadow Massacre and the U.S. government's legal battles to end, all plural, mar end plural marriage kept Mormonism in the press for years. However, after the 1903 to 1907 Reed Smoot Senate hearings, the LDS Church embarked on a new course of currying favor with the outside world. As the sermons of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young faded into the past, the LDS Church entered into a period of public relations to reshape its image into one of patriotism, family values, and clean living. When Fawn Brody published her landmark biography of Joseph Smith, No Man Knows My History, in 1945, she reopened the old wounds of the LDS Church's troubled past. Her biography was followed by dozens of books challenging Mormonism. But it would take the invention of the internet for those issues to become known worldwide. In our fall 2013 newsletter, Apostasy in Sweden, we related the experience of a number of LDS members who through the internet became aware of the challenges to Mormon truth claims. Quote, some Mormons search the web and find doubt declared the front page story of the New York Times on July 21st, 2013. Laurie Goodstein reported that Hans Madsen, LDS European Authority 70, from 2000 to 2005, and approximately 600 LDS members, mainly in Sweden, were sharing their doubts through contact on the internet. When members came to Mr. Madsen with their questions, he found himself ill-prepared to answer them, and he approached his superiors for answers. One of the catalysts for some members in Sweden to start investigating LDS claims derived from the news stories in 2005 relating to the 200th anniversary of Joseph Smith's birth, where historical issues unfamiliar to the Swedes were discussed in the press. A local stake president approached Hans Matson for answers. This was the first time Matson had heard of Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon by staring at a stone in his hat, or DNA issues, or differing accounts of Smith's first vision, Smith's polyandry, and problems with the Book of Abraham. Hans promised this person that he would look into the matter. Finally, a meeting was set up in 2005 for the stake president that had brought the questions to him, Hans Matson and a few other Mormons to meet with Matson's superior and L. Tom Perrier, an apostle of the LDS Church. The stake president, who had brought up some of the questions to Matson, arrived with a stack of photocopies documenting the various problem areas of Mormon history, which was soon appropriated by the top leaders that were at the meeting with a promise that they would get back to him about that. The apostle announced that he had a manuscript in his briefcase that once it was published would prove all the doubters wrong. 
But Mr. Madsen said the promised book never appeared, and when he asked the apostle about it, he was told it was impertinent to ask about that. The apostle announced that, uh, excuse me, when the purported manuscript, was the purported manuscript just a delay tactic, or did the apostle realize the answers in his briefcase were not sufficient for the questions? To date, no such book has appeared. The New York Times article continues, quote, that encounter is what really set off Madsen's doubts. He began reading everything he could. He listened to the Mormon Stories podcasts, and he read Joseph Smith Roughstone Rowling, a biography by Richard Bushman, a historian and a Mormon. After being released from his position as a 70 and while recovering from heart surgery, Madsen continued his research looking on the internet, but often finding himself struggling to understand some of the discussions due to the language barrier and issues that he had never considered. He also read Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History, The Life Story of Joseph Smith, and went on to other books. Through his numerous contacts with other questioning members, Matson gathered together an internet study group of 600 Mormons. When news of this group surfaced, the church was worried that they were starting a new church. <laughs> but it was simply a matter of like-minded, questioning Mormons looking for answers. During this time, Matson led a faithful LDS lifestyle, hoping that this would gain him the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Times article went on to say, quote, but when he discovered credible evidence that the church's founder, Joseph Smith, was a polygamist, and that the Book of Mormon and other scriptures were rife with historical anomalies, Mr. Matson said he felt like the foundation on which he had built his life had begun to crumble. Matson said that, quote, when he started sharing what he had learned with other Mormons in Sweden, the state president told him not to talk about it to any members, even his wife and children. He did not obey. I said to them, why are you afraid of the truth? The LDS Church's response to the Swedish members' questions is without precedent, covering seven years, 2005 to 2012, and included two apostles' visits, a meeting with a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy, and two official church historians. During the summer of 2010, LDS Apostle Russell Nelson and Ronald Rasmund of the 70 visited Sweden and met with some of the members, but provided few satisfactory answers. They then promised to send the historians. These are official church payroll and historians. Thus, on Sunday evening, November 28th of 2010, Marlon Jensen, then a member of the First Quorum of the 70 and the official church historian, along with his assistant historian Richard Turley and Eric Kopeski, I'll probably pronounce that wrong, of the First Quorum of the 70 and Ingvar Olson of the Area 70 and approximately 25 members of the LDS Church met privately in a church building in Stockholm, Sweden. Most of them were aware of the various historical issues although a few bishops and stake presidents were not. <laughs> that must have been a real surprise meeting to them. <laughs> While the opening and closing remarks were in Swedish, the major part of the meeting was in English, which was unofficially recorded by one of the attendees. And as a footnote, you can listen to this whole meeting on the internet. Uh, and in our article on our website, we give the footnotes for all of these things I'm reading and it gives the links where you can go and actually listen to the recording of the historians talking to the Swedish uh, Mormons. And there's also a typescript on the internet. So, I mean, this is all over the internet. This isn't something that you just have to take my word on. You can actually listen to this whole proceeding. <clears throat> the following quotes are taken from the transcript of the 2010 meeting. First, the Swedish leaders made comments relating to speaking truth over error and relying on the Holy Spirit for answers. That was in Swedish. Then Marlon Jensen spoke of the combination of feeling and intellect in seeking answers, implying that the information outside of official church channels was unreliable. 
He then reassured the members, quote, that everything the church has in the way of historical information will one day become available to the whole world. And one of the ways we'll do that is by putting on the internet our church history, catalog that list of everything that we have, and then over time, we'll make digital copies of all our documents and make those available to people across the world, end quote. Unfortunately, it appears that that project will extend for years to come. And even posting the various photos of Smith's letters and church documents fails to help the average person find resolution to troubling historical issues. While many welcome the plan to make digital images of the early LDS documents, this is still not addressing the need for official LDS church answers. Jensen continued, quote, There will always be two forces working on us, the light of the spirit of Christ and the spirit of the devil. Later, he commented, every day as we're in the midst of this, brothers and sisters, we have to make a decision. And the central decision we have to make is whether we're going to believe or whether we're going to doubt. He concluded, quote, most of us who have decided to believe are as aware of the questions that you have as you are, and maybe even a lot more questions that you haven't even thought about yet, end of quote. Jensen went on to observe, quote, there's nothing that I know about Mormonism that bothers me. Are there contradictions? Are there inconsistencies? Are there paradoxes? Yes. One member called out, quote, and you're aware of a lot more things that we might not be aware of yet, but still you stand and you think, I can stand for this, end of quote, to which Jensen replied, right. So I'm just saying that they're good questions. They're questions that are being asked by others, and there are a lot more questions that could be asked. The member responded, will you have very good answers? <laughs> if you listen to this on the recording, this is a heated exchange. <laughs> Jensen then commented, you'll see in a minute. We'll have what answers we have. He then entered into a discussion of how things are spiritually discerned, and each one must make your own decision. The leader then took questions from the audience. While the questions and discussions could have been broken into many different parts, those at the meeting seemed to agree that it boiled down to 15 basic questions. So I'm just going to summarize, although it sounds long, I'm going to this is a summary of uh, what the discussion was. So there's 15 points. Number one, the first question related to the translation process used to produce the Book of Mormon. Why would God and the Nephites go to such effort to preserve the ancient plates when they didn't seem to be used by Smith to translate? Those who witnessed the process, such as David Whitmer and Emma Smith, described Smith placing his face in a hat and staring at a stone utilizing some sort of visionary process while the plates were either covered up or over to the side of the room, or maybe not even in the room. When asked why Smith used the hat, Turley responded, quote, the hat was apparently to block light out so that Joseph could see what he was doing with the record. Sometimes the light, you know, affects your spirit. We don't know exactly how it works, but he did say this, in the early days of his translation, he was relying on revelatory tools of some sort or other, Urim and Thummim, seer stones, whatever the case may be, end of quote. Someone asked how this could be called a translation when Smith wasn't even looking at the plates. <laughs> also related to that was a question about misleading church artwork. Joseph Smith is always depicted in church publications, sitting at a desk, staring at the plates, running his finger over the characters while dictating to a scribe. However, those who witnessed the process, like Martin Harris, David Whitmer, Emma Smith, Emma's father Isaac Hale, Smith's brother William, they describe him looking at his seer stone placed in the hat instead of looking at the plates. Isn't the church being deceptive when they print pictures that do not show the actual process? And these were, it was a longer discussion, but that's what the gist of they were all asking. Turley responded by pointing out that old Christian art wrongly depicts people in the Holy Land as dressed in European garb. It is the artist's choice. 
but he sidestepped the issue of official LDS artwork always depicting Joseph Smith sitting at a table looking at the plates as though he was doing a regular translation. Someone spoke up, quote, can you see that we feel deceived? When you say translated, you have the record and you translated, but he wasn't. To which Turley responded, I think that's a difference in perception rather than in reality. When Joseph used the term translate, he meant revelation, okay? Okay, number two. The next point was the issue of polygamy and polyandry. Turley explained, this is the church historian, did Joseph Smith practice plural marriage? Yes. Many church members don't know it, but the answer is yes. Did Joseph Smith practice polyandry, which is marrying, uh, in Joseph's case, women that already had living husbands? Turley's answer, yes. Joseph Smith, this, I'm, still, I'm quoting Turley, Joseph Smith did practice polyandry. That's marrying women that have living husbands. That's a church historian, officially says this on record and it's on the internet, you can hear him say it. He goes on to say, how many wives did Joseph Smith have? We're in the process, as you know, of preparing the papers of Joseph Smith for publication. We hope to include in the papers of Joseph Smith a list of Joseph Smith's wives based on the best available evidence. Turley continued, quote, so we'll answer that question in the future. Why did he marry the wives of people who were already married? That actually boils down to a marriage by marriage statement and it's fairly complex, but it's an excellent question. <laughs> End of quote. <laughs> One of the problems of polyandry is that it is not covered in Smith's polygamy revelation. The Doctrine and Covenants section 132 verses 61 through 62 allow for plural marriage with virgins not with women, with living husbands. When pressed about whether polygamy was a current doctrine, meaning today, he replied, quote, we do believe in polygamy. We don't practice polygamy. That's what I'm trying to say. When pressed about whether or not the church officially endorses Smith's polyandry, Turley stated, quote, I've never seen a formal statement on that. Either Joseph Smith was a prophet of God or he wasn't. Correct? End of quote. That's the end of polygamy on that discussion. Okay, then, okay, third, third point. Was it right and Christ-like to force women into polygamous marriages? A member asked if it was right, this is a quote from their statement, was it right to take the wives or have sex with wives that are already married to other men, to take other women in a secret way, force them into some kind of marriage? I would like to call it mistresses or forcing 14-year-olds to marry him against their will. I just don't understand behind his wife. The deeper you go into this, the worse it becomes, end of quote. On the issue of Smith marrying 14 and 60 year old girls, Turley tried to dismiss this on the grounds that the girls married younger on the frontier. <laughs> However, Nauvoo, Illinois in the 1840s was not exactly the frontier. It had 12,000 inhabitants, similar to Chicago, and a local militia of 2,500 men. Newspaper, and all of those sorts of things you would find in a civilized establishment. Also, there were, these were not legal marriages, which would have given the teenager the right of financial support from her husband. It would give her standing in the community and rights of inheritance. These were illegal, clandestine unions done in the strictest secrecy and especially kept secret from Joseph's wife, Emma. The Swedish member was not to be put off. This is a quote. But why does my spirit talk to me and screams wrong, wrong, wrong? even if it's the prophet of God. Do I have the devil in me who's talking to me and says I should understand this? 14 and 16 year old girls marrying? So he did that, right? It was God told him to do that? Go behind Emma and take these wives? End of quote. At this point, one of the Swedish leaders stepped in explaining that there are many things in the Old Testament that we don't understand. Quote, 
So I don't know why Joseph did what Joseph did. One thing that I know is Moses was a prophet, I know. I know that Jesus is the son of God. And I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. I know that. And that was the end of the discussion on plural marriage. Okay, the fourth issue they brought up was the problem with the book of Abraham and its supposed translation from the Egyptian papyri that Smith purchased in 1835 in Kirtland, Ohio. Egyptologists have now translated the papyri and found that they have nothing to do with Abraham. Turley responded, quote, Book of Abraham. Well, very quickly, let me just say a few things about it very simply. Number one, and again, it was received by revelation. Number two, we don't have all the papyrus. Number three, we've seen a lot of studies on the so-called alphabet and grammar book, but there's some excellent research coming out of BYU in the next year that you need to read. That's all I have to say about that. Well, his points one and two seem to contradict each other. If the book of Abraham was a revelation, then why bring up the missing pieces out of the papyri? Even if one were to concede, which the critics don't, that the text of the book of Abraham was actually contained on one of the few missing pieces of papyri, it is clear from the extant papyri, including one of the three facsimiles, that Smith was indeed using them for his supposed translation. For Turley to simply say that we don't have all the papyrus does not dismiss the fact that the parts that we do have clearly show Smith was creating the book of Abraham, but not from the, the papyri in front of him. The papyri clearly depict Egyptian funeral documents. They have nothing to do with Abraham. They are strictly Egyptian funerary scenes. Then the discussion moved to point five, lying for the Lord. One of the Swedes asks, quote, I have a question that's really related to polygamy. When I was on my mission in London in the 70s, we were taught a very important principle called lying for the Lord. I mean, we were taught that. And it's supposed to have been coined this phrase, I think, by John Taylor. And I wonder if you think that there are circumstances where it's okay to withhold or manipulate truth just to defend or uphold the reputation of the church. Is lying for the Lord still alive? That's my question. Turley responded, there are these clashes where sometimes one moral imperative or ethical imperative becomes superior to another. When people bring up this topic, what they're usually talking about is during plural marriage time, periods when people were asking about plural marriage, and again, it's a complicated subject, but basically, people were trying to decide do I say something or do I not? Do I tell the truth or do I not? Do we teach as a church that you should lie? No, we don't, end of quote. Well, he's just given the excuse of why they lied about polygamy. So obviously they justify lying on certain occasions. <laughs> Again, Turley sidesteps the basic issue of the ethics of Joseph Smith and all church leaders lying about their e illegal secret polygamy prior to 1852 when they made a public announcement about it. The sixth issue that came up uh, related to the church purchasing documents from fellow Mormon Mark Hoffman in the 1980s without the leaders detecting that they were actually buying forgeries. Hoffman met on numerous occasions with the president of the LDS Church and various apostles, showing them his documents. Why didn't the prophet realize the papers were fakes? Turley quickly dismissed this problem by simply referring people to his book, Victims, the LDS Church and the Mark Hoffman case. However, his book does not provide an answer to the question of how a prophet can thus be deceived. Okay, then we move to seven. The seventh question related to Brigham Young's blood atonement sermons, where he taught that certain sins required personal blood atonement. When pressed on the issue of whether or not this was practiced, Turley responded, quote, My personal belief is that during Joseph Smith's time period, based on statements in the Bible, Joseph Smith said that when men shed blood, their blood should be shed. And I think that when you got into Brigham Young times, that scripture was taken literally for a time. Turley then discussed blood atonement in relation to capital punishment. 
However, this ignores all the other times blood atonement was advanced by Brigham Young and others for sins other than murder, such as adultery, theft, marrying a black woman, and apostasy. One example of such preaching is Young's sermon in 1857, and this is a quote from his sermon. Now take a person in this congregation who has knowledge with regard to being saved, and suppose that he has committed a sin that he knows will deprive him of that, that exaltation which he desires and that he cannot attain to without the shedding of his blood and also knows that by having his blood shed, he will atone for that sin and be saved and exalted with the gods. Is there a man or woman in this house but would say, shed my blood that I may be saved and exalted with the gods? End of quote. When pressed about whether blood atonement had ever been carried out, Turley responded, I think it's possible. <laughs> he then moved on to the first vision. <laughs> okay, point number eight. First vision. If Smith was persecuted by the locals for saying he saw God and Jesus in 1820, why isn't there any mention in early church publications of that vision? Most members of the church in 1830 hadn't even heard of it. Today, the 1820 vision is presented as crucial to the founding of Mormonism, yet early converts didn't seem to know about it. How can this be? But this ignores, oh, excuse me, Turley commented, quote, in terms of church history, when people tell any kind of an account of history, it's always selective. If I ask you a question, tell me about your years in high school, the story you tell me may be different from the story I get from your high school boyfriend or another student in your class, end of quote. But this ignores the problem of Smith himself giving several different accounts of the first vision, in which not just a few minor points are changed, but rather some of the most important ones, such as the purpose for the prayer, the date, who appears in the vision, is it Jesus, angels, or God and Jesus. The message that was delivered to young Joseph changes. In the only account in Smith's own handwriting, in his private 1832 journal, he states that the Lord appeared, but says nothing about God the Father. This account was not made public for over 100 years. In 1835, he mentioned to an acquaintance that many angels appeared in the first vision, but this was not printed until many years later. In addition, the account currently printed at the back of the Pearl of Great Price, in which God the Father and Jesus appear, was not printed until 1842, 22 years after the supposed event. <clears throat> Moving on to the ninth issue they covered, censoring church history. One of the Swedes asked, quote, Do the leaders of the church really believe that they are actually inspired by God to act in such a way just to tell a selected nice version of the church, the history of the church, in order to get more converts. Do they believe they are inspired to do this? Historian Jensen responded, quote, Our history was often written in what was called apologetic style, and in doing that we were being selective. And we are at the time now, I think, when our history could be told as completely and fully as technology can allow us to tell. There's never been an attempt to suppress the history of the church or to tell the church's history in some untrue true way or to put it in an untrue light to gain some advantage, to gain converts. Then he turns to Hans Madsen. Hans, I sense that about you. We haven't betrayed you. These things that you have learned about through the Internet have always been known, have always been out there in the books. The 19th wife, uh, that's the plural wife of Brigham Young that left him and sued for the divorce. The 19th wife wrote her story years ago. It's just that it's published now, everybody reads it, and they think they found something new about polygamy. It's been there forever, end of quote. Here this historian are clearly sidestepping the issue. Yes, many of these problems have been known about for years, but not through official church sources. Wife number 19 was written by an apostate ex-wife of Brigham Young, hardly a book the church would ever encourage a member to read. In 1945, Fawn Brody wrote, No Man Knows My History, for which she was excommunicated. But Mormons have traditionally been told not to read that. 
Not only has the church hid its history, it has discouraged its members from reading outside sources. In the past, it has only been after a problem becomes well known and thus embarrassing that the LDS church has decided to write about it. They have certainly not taken the lead in explaining the troubling parts of their past until it becomes critical. Why is it that not only now, why is it that only now the LDS church is finally making a greater attempt to tell its history, quote, as completely and fully as technology can allow, when they've had literally decades to do so? In short, why is the LDS church needing to play catch up to what outside historians have been writing about for decades? When Mormon historians have tried to write more fully about embarrassing parts of the church's past, it has often resulted in the person being disfellowshipped, excommunicated, receiving warnings from church leadership, or forced into retirement from church employment. Tenth issue, should members know all the truth? One person mentioned Apostle Boyd Packer's statements to the PBS television program, The Mormons, done in 2007. Quote, Elder Packer says there that it's not good for the members to know all the truth. He said as a watchman on the tower, he might stop things that could hurt. <clears throat> Packer made a similar statement in 1981 to a group of LDS church educators at BYU. Quote, there is a temptation for the writer or the teacher of church history to want to tell everything, whether it's worthy or faith-promoting or not. Some things that are true are not very useful, end of quote. <laughs> so the historian responds, the question is really, is all truth useful? Turley later commented, watchman on the tower. This is something, as you mentioned, President Packer talks about a lot. I think his concern is that providing information to people in a way that's going to destroy their faith carries with it a responsibility. And that's all I'm going to say about that, end of quote. This seems to be an admission that full disclosure of LDS history could hurt a person's testimony, which contradicts the idea that if they really have all the answers, that they're going to put them on these documents that are coming out. Eleventh point, priesthood restoration. Why is there a lack of early documents reporting the appearance of the angels to restore the priesthood? This is a quote from one of the members. One thing that really bothers me is the lack of contemporary sources for the angelic visitations. And he's referring to Peter, James, and John, and John the Baptist uh, relating to the restoration of the priesthood. And the member goes on, I understand from both Michael Quinn and Bushman, the Mormon historians, they say, as I understand it, there are sources from 1820 to 1830, affidavits, letters, minutes, but none of them ever mentions an angelic visitation or the priesthood. So I wonder, why are there not any contemporary testimonies? Or are there? End of question. Turley tried to smooth this one over. Quote, number one, the church in its earliest days was essentially a church of oral tradition, okay? People did not write things. Joseph Smith really starts writing things down. Our first revelation for which we have documentation is in the late 20s. So the first thing he starts writing is scripture. And then early revelations do have references to an angelic visions. Section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, Articles and Covenants of the Church, is an example of that. Section 20 has reference to angelic visitations. End of quote. Turley just admitted that records of Smith's revelations were being kept in the late 1820s. So why isn't there a contemporary account of the so-called priesthood restoration? It seems rather odd that Turley mentions DNC section 20 to support the, anything of angels and the priesthood. The only angel specified in section 20 has to do with the angel who told Joseph Smith about the gold plates. Clearly claims of Peter, James, and John restoring priesthood authority were not known in 1829 or 1830. Again, the historians provide no answer to the question. Next problem, number 12. One person questioned the background of the revelation granting priesthood to blacks in 1978. Hadn't there been earlier efforts to change the doctrine? 
At one point, the questioner mentioned D. Michael Quinn's book, but didn't give a specific reference. So I looked it up, and according to Quinn's book, Mormon Hierarchy, Extensions of Power, in 1969, Apostle Hugh Brown was able to get a proposal allowing full priesthood to blacks approved by the Quorum of the Twelve, which church president David O. McKay was unable to do anything about because he wasn't functioning, and it was opened to the two counselors in the Quorum of the Twelve to make a joint declaration on whatever they were going to do. However, Apostle Harold B. Lee opposed the matter and persuaded the Quorum of the Twelve to rescind its vote to approve to give priesthood to blacks clear back in 69, which delayed giving the priesthood to blacks for many years. One Swede asked, quote, Is this true, that there were apostles that went against the question to give the priesthood to the blacks? Later, Turley responded, The June 1978 revelation has a history to it, like all revelations. You have this period of time in which saints are studying it out in the mind and they eventually flower as a revelation. <laughs> the questioner persisted, referring again to Quinn's book. But my question was, was it three of the apostles that didn't agree with David O. McKay? To which Turley replied, well, I haven't looked into the sources myself. I don't know. And that was the end of the discussion on blacks and priesthood. Number 13, someone brought up bad temple experiences. One member wondered why some people had bad experiences when they first attend the endowment ceremony. He, this member commented, when I went to the temple the first time, it was 1970, and this would have been during the older ritual when they used to take the blood oaths uh, on swearing on their life. After being in there the first day, I was terrified. I couldn't sleep at night. I thought, what is this, you know? There was a black hole in my heart, and I had nightmares the whole week. I thought, what is this? Have I been deceived? Later, the Swede adds, why do we have such a bad feeling when we come to the temple? If the Holy Ghost was there, this would give a testimony. You would feel good. Marlon Jensen responded by telling of his own daughter's first experience at the temple. <clears throat> I remember sitting with our first daughter after her first temple endowment, which I attended with her. Now, this would have been before the changes in 1990, so they would have still had the old slit your throat stuff in it. I think my little daughter was quite worthy, but she was so disturbed, so surprised by the nature of what happened there that I'm not sure the Holy Ghost had a chance to really help her that day. <laughs> I remember sitting with her in the celestial room while she cried and said, Dad, what's this all about? And I wish I had done a better job. But she has persisted, and she loves what she feels there now. But it's taken some time. The witness of the Holy Spirit isn't a tape that we just, uh, a tape we can always run with. To which the member responded, well, I think what you're saying now is your answer to everything. If we just keep doing it, we'll feel good about it. <clears throat> Interestingly, Jensen didn't mention that the ceremony had been changed in 1990 and 2005 to remove many of the elements that had disturbed people, specifically his daughter. Evidently, the church realized the ceremony, as first presented by Joseph Smith, was too graphic, too Masonic, too tied to 19th century attitudes and needed to be rewritten to appeal to new members. <clears throat> the fourth, 14th point, Vikings and the Book of Mormon. The people wanted to know, why is there no evidence that the Book of Mormon people ever existed? A member asked, quote, we had some Vikings visit North America about a thousand years ago, and today we know exactly where they lived. There are archaeological evidences that they leave there. So what about all the millions of people who had to be Lamanites or Nephites? What kind of evidence can you show that they actually existed? <clears throat> this same person then later commented, I, I mean, there were millions of people building cities and creating wagons with wheels and horses, and they had so many things, weapons, destroying things. 
So I guess there should be some traces somewhere in the whole of the Americas if they ever existed. He also asked about the lack of DNA evidence for Israelites in pre-Columbus America. Turley combined all these issues in lack of archaeology and Book of Mormon DNA and the lack of evidence for Semitic people into one uh, long stretch of comments. And one of the things he said, quote, as you know, there are cultural ruins and all over the Americas. The question is, were these Book of Mormon peoples or not? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Some people have tried to answer that using the DNA to say maybe these were Book of Mormon people, maybe they were not. Are there any DNA experts here? Which I assume no one said yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you my best answer on DNA to which a member called out, is it going to be the same as Fair and Farms? That's the Mormon apologetic sites. Turley responded, hmm, it may be. <laughs> he then went into a long discussion of tracing particular family lines, which isn't quite the same as determining origins of people groups. Quote, we're continuing to learn over time. The body of types of DNA for these people is growing. With this one, we have no way of knowing the answer. We do not know what Lehi's DNA was. But this sidesteps the issue that Native American DNA shows that they descended from Asians, not Semitic people. The member wasn't satisfied with Turley's answer. Quote, I actually don't think that's correct according to scientific evidence today. I think you actually can trace back to within DNA and tell, for instance, where the Swedish people are coming from or where the Asian people are coming from. Again, the historian could supply no answer for the Book of Mormon problems. The 15th issue they raised was Brigham Young's Adam God Doctrine, <clears throat> where he taught that there's a hierarchy of gods and our Heavenly Father is Adam, the God to whom we pray. So the question was, why did Brigham Young teach something that was opposed by some of the apostles and seemed to divide the church? Why wasn't Young able to convince the others that his doctrine was right? Turley responded, well, Adam God, that's complicated again because you've got a lot of sources, meaning lots of sermons of Brigham Young. I haven't seen an official church position that goes back to deconstruct all those sources. So as a historian, I have to say, if you look at the evidence, sometimes it's a little squishy. <laughs> you can find evidence that goes both directions. In other words, he's trying to say <clears throat> that you could show Brigham Young sometimes taught Adam God and sometimes Brigham seemed to be teaching the standard view of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Of course, that doesn't answer the question of why some of the time he was teaching a completely heretical doctrine by Mormon standards today. Again, the historian <clears throat> was unable to provide an answer why the president and prophet of the church would be teaching a false view of God. <clears throat> In 1877, Brigham Young even introduced the Adam-God doctrine <clears throat> into the LDS endowment temple ceremony at the St. George Temple. And if you think about that, this obviously is very serious. If you're going to teach Adam God from the pulpit, okay, maybe a person could dismiss it. But if you're going to introduce it into the temple ritual at the lecture on the veil, that's making it doctrine. And historians can see that he did put that in the lecture at the veil in St. George. Of course, it's been taken out now. <clears throat> So, uh, Spencer W. Kimball responded to all the questions in 1978, uh, 76 about the uh, people that raised questions on Adam God. And he warned, we warn you against the dissemination of doctrines which are not according to the scriptures and which are alleged, alleged to have been taught by some of the general authorities of past generations. Such, for instance, as the Adam God theory. Now, well, let me interject here. What does he mean alleged to have been preached? We have, what, 20, at least 20 years of Brigham Young sermons printed in church publications where he taught Adam God. This isn't just an alleged thing by outsiders. 
Okay, so he goes, so Kimball goes on with his statement. We denounce that theory, meaning the out of God theory. We denounce that theory and hope that everyone will be cautioned against this and other kinds of false doctrine. Well, this raises a question. When does a prophet speak for God? Young, as God's prophet, declared the Adam-God doctrine to be a revelation. Kimball, as God's prophet, declared it to be false doctrine. <clears throat> How do we make that decision? Well, this all ended up with more questions than answers. After the initial listing of their 15 questions, one member asked if they could get references later so they could check them out. Jensen responded, we brought a handout for you. These are the five very best websites for authentic answers to those questions. While we don't have the web list that was handed out, it's assumed that it was the same one they later passed out uh, in 2012, which were uh, three LDS sites. One was to FAIR and one was to another Mormon guy's website. And so then this, one of the Swedes said, he wanted to know if these were official answers on these websites. Uh, and he said, I tried to find the church's own version about these things, to which Turley responded, they don't exist. <laughs> Since these historians were already aware of the historical problems bothering the Swedes before they came, one wonders why the historians arrived at the meeting with no prepared answers. These were not new issues. Most of these questions had been troubling various Mormons for decades. For many, the 2010 meeting with the historians did not turn out to be convincing. Two years later, we find in 2012 that there was growing unrest amongst the Swedes. And so uh, the Area Authority 70 over Sweden at that time, uh, Ingvar Olsen, sent out a document that's been referred to as the Swedish Rescue. In it was a letter from the church historian Jensen, who had met with them earlier. And uh, so I'll have to just summarize what the, his letter advised them. <clears throat> Number one, the LDS Church does not hide historical facts. Number two, the internet has made information more available to members around the world, but it wasn't a matter of suppression. Number three, church leaders are only human. They sometimes make mistakes. Of course, they don't clarify which ones are the mistakes. Number four, one must seek a testimony and keep the commandments. Well, they still didn't provide any answers to the questions. So again, the Swedish rescue failed. They still did not provide answers to these things. <clears throat> this possibly is one of the reasons for the 2013 uh, comment in conference where Apostle Jeffrey Holland stated, <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, this is the divine work in progress, in process, with the manifestations and blessing of it abounding in every direction. So please, don't hyperventilate, hyperventilate if from time to time issues arise that need to be examined, understood, and resolved. When doubt or difficulty come, do not be afraid to ask for help. Okay, who do we ask? The Swedish people asked for help. They went to the church for answers to their questions. They sent apostles, they sent historians. They still received no answers. How are you on a local level gonna go to your bishop and ask for help? The bishop doesn't know any more about these things than you. He may know less than you do. So it's hardly an answer to say, ask for help. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, the internet search engines like Google give instant access to the sources, causing many to leave Mormonism today. The internet has also made it possible for some, someone investigating Mormonism to learn about the problem areas of doctrine and the historical issues prior to committing to Mormon baptism. It has also made it possible for those questioning or leaving Mormonism to get in contact with various ministries and former Mormons who are now Christians. When the membership statistics were announced at the April 2014 LDS conference, 
It was apparent that their growth is slowing in spite of the increase of their missionary numbers. <clears throat> they went from 59,000 men and women on the mission field in uh, 2012 to 83,000 missionaries in 2013. But this did not increase the per convert per missionary number. We know that the, if you do the average out of the number of missionaries on the mission field and the number of converts for the year, you will find that in 2012, the average for a Mormon missionary was to baptize 4.61 people. The average the next year in 2013 fell to 3.48%. This is with 30,000 more missionaries in the field. And the per missionary convert rate dropped a whole percent. <clears throat> The uh, percent of growth can be looked at another way. If you look at the percent of the growth of the entire church from year to year, the Mormon church gives statistics on this. You can find it on their website. Uh, you may have to look a little, but it's there. The percentage growth in 1999 was the highest it's been since then. And at that point, it was a 3.85% growth from the year before. In 2012, the growth rate dropped to 2.36%. That's the growth rate for the whole church. And then in 2013, it dropped again to 2.3%. So what you see on a graph is this decline of the percentage growth of Mormonism. It is essentially flatlining. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. It isn't just the internet. People are having less children, but they're also obviously making less converts, and they also are not keeping their converts. Everyone I talk to coming back from the mission field tells me <clears throat> that at least uh, oh, 30, they only retain about like a 25% activity level of converts after a year or two. I mean, they just walk out the door. Many of them don't show up the next Sunday after getting baptized. So this is a revolving door on all of this. <clears throat> In conclusion, I want to encourage you that uh, there are people coming out of Mormonism. Unfortunately, many are coming out and becoming nothing. Fortunately, there are many coming out and becoming Christians, and we certainly see that in the churches today. All of our churches here in Utah are half full of former Mormons. Yeah. There are a lot of Christians in this community, uh, which means that it's more likely for a Mormon to bump into someone who's a Christian, and that's wonderful. But we need to be prepared to share the love of Christ with them and give them a reason for the hope that is within us. Amen. I want to read a little bit from an email I received just uh, a couple of months ago. I studied your website, UTLM, to learn the truth. And now I have a wonderful personal relationship with the real God and Savior and a trust in God's precious and cherished word of the Holy Bible. Thank you with endless gratitude for doing the Lord's work. Now I know that other ministries to Mormons have received similar emails. I'm not out here doing this alone. And I thank God for everybody that has been involved in ministry to the Mormons. But I hope we'll be encouraged to reach out to those around us. I realize that not everyone who leaves Mormonism will embrace Christianity, but many will. May God bless you in your efforts to share the grace of God with those around you. Thank you.